Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Um, hope everybody's relaxed. Uh, we're about to not get relaxed. So. Yeah. <laughs> I give you a little idea of uh, what the format tonight. Uh, we got Chris R to speak for the next hour or so, and then Mark and Dave are going to come back and join him. And a bunch of you filled out some questions that you gathered over the last day and a half that we had. Um, I'm sure I saw people squirming in their seats a little bit, including myself, um, and stirred up some questions. And they're going to try and answer some of them. And let's see. Why did I get? Why did we get Chris here? I guess real quick. Uh, the first time Dave handed me a, a, a tape of Chris's, and uh, I was listening to it in the car, and I was ready to just about drive over to the airport and get on a plane to Texas because I thought this guy needs help. He is angry. Um, and then I put the tape on at home and I listened to what he said and I identified a lot and I felt exactly he wasn't angry. He was full of passion for this program. Um, just like myself, and I couldn't deny a thing that he said, um, and he actually got me passionate again, more passionate for what this program has done for me, um, so we asked him to come down here and share his passion with us about what we've been talking about this weekend, so Chris off. Can, can y'all hear me all right? <laughs> I won't need this in a few minutes anyway. <laughs> My name's Chris Covered Alcoholic, uh, who's fixing to lose his voice. Uh, it's something I picked up in Texas, I guarantee you. This is not anything I can't blame on New York. Uh, this is an amazing thing here. I uh, Give me a second. I... I Man, I need to thank the cat that made this made this possible. Bart and and Rick and and all the all the Bud Denise that I just <laughs> I uh, I travel a lot. I I, uh, I get to speak. I'm, I'm honored to get to do anything in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I also speak some in uh, in our sister fellowships of Cocaine Anonymous, and uh, I. Uh, I travel a lot and get to come to lots of conferences, and of course, it's just it's the obligatory thing to do, you know. Oh well, this is such a nice place, you know, and, it, and you've you've been tortured all day long, you know. But the truth is, I mean, this was so well organized, and I mean, great service from top to bottom, and uh, I'm uh, I'm honored to be here. I'm I'm a little uh, I t- I'm blown away by New York. I, you know, it's like every time I travel someplace, I says, well, Chris, you know, try not to act like a tourist, you know. But then, but how can we flew in over to LaGuardia last night and flew right over the city, and it's like, you know, and Jeannie was my, my wife's here with me, and she she's she's got the aisle seat, right? And so it was like a minute. It was like, wait a minute, I'm the one that's speaking. I need the aisle seat, you know. I mean, I was like, I'll just crawl over. You know, we're looking out the windows. It's it's like y'all live in a tremendous place. I, I, uh, I'm blown away. I, next time we'll come back and get to spend a little more time. Uh, Jeannie got to do some sightseeing today, and uh, I got to sit and listen to two of my absolute heroes in this fellowship. Um, Mark sponsor, and uh, he uh, he will keep me honest tonight, I guarantee you. And uh, and Dave, uh, Dave, I met, I met, I don't know, a couple years ago. It's uh, he, I got a call out of the clear blue sky, and he says, this Chris, and he, uh, he was in San Antonio, which is an hour drive from where I live, and uh, I live in a little town called Ingram, Texas, and it is a, uh, <laughs> well, it's just as country as can be. It's just, it's a, uh, Ingram, Texas. I, I, uh, uh, we all have, uh, wives and, and, and date sheep there in Ingram, Texas. I, I, I don't know. That's the first thing in divorce court. Was it a sheep or was it a real woman? And it's like, uh, it's pretty country. It's pretty stupid up there. And I'm sorry. I, I need to say, but anyway, Dave came up and sat in a little big book with us and, and he just out of clear blue showed up and we got to visit and, and he's been a, a bud ever since. And I, I honor and respect him for carrying the, carrying a message. Um, I need to tell you, you know, he spent a lot of time today apologizing right off the bat, you know, uh, um, you know, from cussing and the tone of his voice and the way he may have looked at you. And, I'll, you know, I'm just, I'm not that spiritually fit. Like, I, I'm going to tell you, I'm not, you, you know, I, I'm going to tell you going in the door, it's going to be my attempt not to cuss. I, I, I don't think it's respectful, but, but I can tell you right now, I'm going to, I'm going to, 
I'm going to fail miserably at it. So you might as well, you might as well, no, and if it offends you, go away. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. I, I, it's a character defect that's, that's, that's being removed from me. Uh, not too, too damn quick, but it's being removed. And I, I, uh, I don't know. 13 years ago, guys, uh, God, uh, God did a number on me. And, uh, after years in and out of the fellowship, he removed the obsession, uh, for me to drink and drug. And I'm, I'm pretty, uh, pretty passionate about that. I, I, I got a friend in, in uh, Kerrville that said one time, he said, it's a, he said, it's a, he comes from Houston and he said, it's a tragedy that we, some of us in our, in our fellowships have to feel out of place in the, in our, the own, our own fellowship, the fellowship that saved our life. We've got to feel, uncomfortable in those rooms because the message we're carrying is so different from the message that most people are carrying out there. And, and, and that's the truth. It's, it's, it's sad that if you're a big book thumper in most parts of this country, you are ostracized. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this. And I'm going to, I want everybody, please, I'm, I'm not going to get long-winded. I can promise you I won't keep you here longer than about 45 minutes. But I, and I'm going to say some things tonight that I can assure you are going to, are going to, you know, you will either, <laughs> you will either bond with me, we will, we will share Christmas cards and swap spit, I mean, we, we will, we will, we will bond, or you will do like happens every time I speak, I spend, I speak lots and lots, folks, and I've never seen it fail, and you will, you will wait for me at the door, and Take exception with something I've said, and I and I and I'm down with that, folks. I just want I want to make it kind of clear here. You know, this is this is what the fellowship's about. Y'all ask me to come up here and share my experiences. So Dave alluded to it earlier. This is my experience. It doesn't have to be your experience. If, if if what I say goes exactly against what you believe, that's that's one of the cool things about this deal. I, you can believe whatever you want to believe. If it's working for you, bop to you drop. But. <laughs> But I need to tell you a couple of things, right? I need to tell you a couple of things right off the bat. You see, where, where my passion comes from, what Bart said is so true. You know, it's like it, it hurts my feelings sometimes because sometimes when people pick up tapes of mine, they don't know me and they don't listen to the first part where I'm trying to explain where I'm coming from. All they hear is this guy screaming on the other end of the goddamn phone and then he's raising and he's like, this is one real angry individual. You know, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, I'm as quiet and I'm as... You know, <laughs> Y'all sit right here and watch me sit right there where Jeannie's sitting. Watch me all day long and never open my mouth. I'm as quiet and shy as you can get. Right up into the point you want to start talking to me about this, and then little something deep down inside says, "This is your chance, buddy. This is this is this is it." You know, <laughs> people have been dissing you all your life. Now you can get even with them. Back. You get a chance that you get a chance to say. Uh, I nearly died getting to these rooms. I, I, I uh, my first attempt at Alcoholics Anonymous was about 1980, and and uh, and I'm and I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But I I'm in and out of the fellowship for years, and 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 Jesus, just you know, I just I walk into the rooms, and and you you tell me I'm going to always be recovering, and that that I'm going to have to admit that I'm powerless, and and then you start talking about every goddamn problem in the world, and and, and I'm just you know, and I and, and you pretty soon you chase me out of the room. And you know, and then and then and then I come back in because because I'm I got arrested again, or 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 she's fixing to leave again, you know. And I made a new commitment. I'm going to come in. I'm going to pick up another one of those stupid desire chips, and then I'm going to sit there and listen for another week while you tell your war stories over. And oh yeah, we can all do it. You know, you can tell you're preaching to the choir in this room. And, I mean, it's like and this is where I'm coming from, folks. At the end of that eight-year stint in and out of the fellowship, I tried to commit suicide in 1987 and ended up back in a room full of people that were carrying big books and understood that you could recover from this stuff and that the book meant what it said and that if you had an opinion that was contrary to what the book said, you might want to keep it to yourself. <laughs> i got to wear cheaters to you. This is a... They say that they make these little monocles. I think that's what I need is a little, mon- <laughs> little monocle thing. I don't know. I need to show you this. I was reading this the other day. It's in uh, Box 459. Y'all, Alcoholics Anonymous produces it here. We may have somebody from Central Service. It, if you're in the audience tonight, since we're this close to New York, let's visit after the meeting. <laughs> I have a message to give some of them fat cats back up there. I guarantee you. It's a, 
one of these little articles here, and this is where I'm coming from. I'm going to jump around a little bit, and I'm going to get into this in just a second, but I, I need to explain it. It says, this is a little report from the General Service Board. He says, the GSO continues to be in good financial condition. The only worrisome trend is a long-term steady decline in sales of AA literature. I got to, I'm going to be speaking in tongues before this thing's 15 minutes into this thing. <laughs> Listen, folks, if, if our only worry as a fellowship is that literature sales are a bit down, shame on us. We've, we've got a fellowship that, that 66 years ago had a success rate of better than 75%. In the Midwest, you can go to any archive around, folks, around Cleveland, Akron. They had success rates of nearly 100% in lots of areas. In the early days, the first few years of Alcoholics Anonymous, everybody that came through the door got sober. And right now in the United States, if you can find any place that's got a better than a 20% success rate, it's a miracle. You, you think we got... I mean, come on, folks, we gotta get straight here. Why am I so fat? People wanna take shots at me all the time. Oh, Chris, you know, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be ripping an AA, but you know, this, it's like I'm not, but this is my fellowship. And the fellowship as a whole needs to wake up and start looking and seeing what we're doing here. We are not getting well in AA. But you see, where the controversy comes is because you got well in AA, you slipped under the door, you, you got through the crack, and you think everybody else should be able to do it. But the truth is, all you've got to do is look at the success rates and stop making excuses. Walk into a meeting and just ask yourself, it's like, is the message that we're hearing today in AA the same message that they heard 66 years ago? And you'll ask, you ask any of the old, they'll tell you without a question, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I do clerical work for a treatment center in, uh, in Texas, and uh, I am not a counselor or a therapist. I love counselors and I love therapy, and don't ever, don't ever misquote me. Because I'll hunt you down and shoot you. Don't. I, I have, I have taken, I have taken more ribbons from that stuff. Well, you hate therapy. I'm a product of good therapy, folks. I'm seeing one today about some other stuff, folks. AA is not a catch-all for every problem in the world, and shame on us for trying to make it a catch-all for every problem in the world. Y'all understand that? And think, you see, but this is what's happened to Alcoholics Anonymous. And so I, I, I go into this treatment center, and when all of these cats are coming through, we got about a thousand people through there a year, and I'm asking these cats, it's a high dollar facility, and I'm asking them, I says, buddy, did you ever go to AA? Oh yeah, we went to AA. It didn't work. Oh, oh, I see. Huh, damn. It worked for me. <laughs> you know, so, so what's, so let's get on down there. Why, why did, oh no, it didn't work. And, and here's what they tell me, guys. And you can ask Mark, you can ask that, anybody that's around the business, you can ask these cats, what, what excuses are they using to not stay in AA? War stories and people pissing and moaning about their problems. And so I come up from and speak from the podium around the country and Canada, wherever I'm speaking, and I, and, I, and I talk about this, and I offend people. Because you think it's your God-given right to walk into a meeting and puke all over the table and let somebody else clean it up. You think it's your right to turn my AA meeting into a damn therapy session. <laughs> it is not. This is your... This is your cue. All you big boys that I've been tapping on the shoulder all day long, it's your cue to move forward now. <laughs> you need some water? Because yeah. I, cause I'm fixing to get rushed here. <laughs> I want to make something real clear, though. I want to make something real clear. Because the first... I know, I really, I know, really, Blake. That's, that's the thing. She's like, I'll fix the little bastard. I know. I know. Look, and what's up with this shit? What's up with this over here? We can't, now I can't see him. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm What's up with this? Mark, come on, Bubba. It's Rick. They start rushing me from this side, little brother. Down there with that, brother. Somebody better have my back. I guarantee you. All right. All right, but let me tell you where I'm coming from here. Because the bottom line is, and I'm sure Mark and, and Dave talk, touched on this last night. We were tied up in the airport and couldn't get here. But I'm sure they touched on this business. 
The truth of the matter is, Alcoholics Anonymous, we assume a lot in AA. We assume that because you're sitting in this room that you're an alcoholic. And, and I'm going to tell you something, folks. That's an assumption that can get you killed because you've got to be careful who you're listening to. Somebody comes in and they start acting like they know what they're talking about around medicine. You assume they're a doctor? No, you're going to check the credentials. But somebody comes in and starts telling you how to work the steps, you assume that they know what they're talking about just because they got some dry time under their belt. But the long and short of it is they may not even be one of us. Y'all understand that? You, in order to get sober, what you may need to do is go to the gym and get laid a little bit more. It works, it works for a lot of people. I mean, I, you know, think. Only about 15% of us, only about 15% of us in this world, folks, are alcoholic and addict, guys. Only about 15%. That's a big percentage, though. Still, uh, 85% of the people can take this stuff or leave it alone. The only requirement for membership, they say, short form anyway, is a desire not to drink. Any moron that comes to the door, I don't want to drink today. One day in time. Great. <laughs> Never even had a problem with alcohol. Never even had a problem with a drinking problem. But he comes in. The women are goddamn good looking. The coffee's great. Fellowship's just bar none. But the best in the West. So I'll just stay one day at a time. <laughs> and, and kill them by the thousands with their bullshit. And kill them by their thousands for their bullshit. Because let me tell you something. Their life doesn't depend on getting connected spiritually. Here's what the book says. Here's what the book... It's going to be the problem section right here. I can see. <laughs> Come on, girl. For those who are unable to drink moderately, the question... This is on page 34, guys, in a chapter called More About Alcoholism. We're assuming, of course, that the reader desires to stop. Again, which is an assumption Bill Wilson understands. Whether such a person can quit on a non-spiritual basis depends upon the extent to which he has already lost the power to choose whether he will drink or not. Get it? Let me do it one more time. I want to, you got to get this piece because Zoe Jesus. Whether such a person can quit upon a non-spiritual basis depends upon the extent to which he has already lost the power to choose whether he will drink or not. You got a guy goes out and gets a DWI, comes into the fellowship for a little bit, goes back out, gets another DWI, and says, "Shit, I'm done with the law. I'm going to stay sober." So he walks into the fellowship. The fear of getting another DWI keeps him sober, and he stays in the fellowship. And he's welcome. Welcome. But if the cat doesn't have to get connected spiritually to stay sober, that's the cat you've got to be careful with what's coming out of his damn mouth. Because, because if his life doesn't depend on God, and he tells a newcomer that they don't have to depend on God, then what do we got? This is why we're not staying sober in the fellowship. We've got a bunch of people believing that they can come into this fellowship and share any damn message they want. It's an individual program. That's not what this book says. This book says precisely how we recovered. Precisely how we recovered. That means, that means that, that means that Bill Wilson got sober doing certain things. If y'all read in his story what, what happened, he ended up doing a fist step with Ebby. He's sitting in Towns Hospital detoxing. He's already making his damned amends when he had his barn burning spiritual experience, approximately nine days in treatment. Y'all with us? <laughs> and then he goes out and gets, gets Dr. Bob. And then Dr. Bob has the same kind of spiritual experience. Oh, it's the, the educational variety. He doesn't see a vision, but the obsession to use is removed from him because he got off his ass and started making his amends. June 10th. That's the birth date of Alcoholics Anonymous. Y'all with us? Two days later, they go out and get alcoholic number three, supposedly, and four and five and six and seven, and the rest is history. And let me tell you where my passion comes from. Let me tell you where my emotion comes from. is because those people followed some simple directions and got their arrogant ego out of the way. I'm sober today, 13 years. And I couldn't stay sober for years because I kept listening to some son of a bitch that believed that they should be able to share anything they wanted into an AA meeting. I, I think at Denny's, they got Denny's in New York. <laughs> they got Denny's everywhere, don't they? I think at Denny's, you should be able to share anything you want. I think around this table back over here having coffee, you should share everything you want. But I think at an AA meeting, when somebody's walking in the door and you don't know who you're talking to, you better be talking out of this book. You better be giving somebody the clear message. Are you willing to risk their life? Okay, who's risking their life? The people around the fellowship. How many of you guys have heard this? Take your time to work the steps. We didn't get this sick overnight. We're not going to get well overnight. 
and we could go just we could take all the little one liners and have a run at them. I mean, it's the bottom line. You can't you can't chair any meetings till you've been sober six months. You can't work with anybody till you've been sober. You, Jesus, unbelievable. Who came up with this shit? Who, who came up with this crap? Because that's the rehab. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. And let the record show that Chris Raymer was not the one that said that. But it is the absolute truth. It is the absolute truth. A bunch of well-meaning people who figured they could make a buck out of this business got hold of this simple message that we were using for 66 years. And now, you, you, you with me? And now, you know, no telling what you might hear. And this is where everybody wants to split hairs with me. Chris, you're knocking rehab. I'm not knocking rehab. Rehab's a wonderful thing. It's the same thing when I'm talking about therapy. Therapy's a wonderful thing. But therapy will not remove the obsession to drink. No human power can remove the obsession to drink. The ABCs in the book were put there for a specific... Do you think Bill Wilson was just having a bad day when he wrote that stuff? <laughs> he got pretty energetic about this business. He, he said, he, he said you can depend on memory. I mean, if you can get sober for a woman, you're an 85 percenter. You're not one of us. If you can get sober for a job, you're not one of us. If you can work through the, your issues around this, that, and the other, and come out the other side, and the obsession, if you can control it and, you, and go on, you're not one of us. Do you all understand that? But we've watered the whole God, fellowship down so that everybody can get comfortable and happy. But you see, we're not here for that. We're here to help the chronic alcoholic whose last hope is a reliance and dependence and a relationship with God. I, absolutely. And it's not about a belief in God. I know. They say you can make a lot of money in the Baptist church. Hell, what am I doing here with you losers? <laughs> Because this is the only thing I can get excited about. Alcohol. I mean, I don't know. You know, I don't know. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me test some of y'all, some of y'all are big book thumpers. A lot of y'all got some knowledge about the big book. So don't correct, don't get me if I'm not exactly clear on, on every little date and then you, but it, when, when Abby came and talked, I'm starting to speak in tongues already. When Abby, let me run something by you. If an alcoholic is somebody who has lost the power to choose and control his alcohol, that the book talks about, go with me, on page 21 it says, and it talks for the next 20 pages about the mental obsession. If you can put alcohol in your body and guarantee me how much you're going to drink every time, you with me? You're not one of us. But if there's times that it gets away from you and you drink a bit more, we used to laugh about it, I just drank quicker than most. <laughs> See? And so I, I was fast. Okay, if you never ever ever drank a bit more than you intended, you have the physical allergy, okay? I'm sure they talked about this last night. Now, the mental obsession piece is, is the piece that gets us. If given sufficient reason, those two DWIs, that screaming match with that wife, that what, whatever, your compromised health, if any of that becomes operative, if you can stop and stay stopped, then you're not one of us. You with me? Okay. So, this is what alcoholic, alcoholism is about. It's about these two words right here, guys. Control and choice. You with me? So when we go into that meeting next week, and y'all take me back over to New York someplace, and we go into a nice little meeting, and some little lady's crying her eyes out because the, the friggin' babysitter didn't show up on time, and she was running late, and she was just having a terrible day, and you know, I've got a run in her hose, and, and the guy's back over there, and he can't find a job, and he just, he just knows. And then we all sit around and smile, and oh, yes, and we try to be patient and tolerant, and yeah, and everybody's watching the clock because they can't wait to get out of there because there's absolutely no power in this meeting. What we've got ourselves into is another bitch session, another complaining session. We've been delivered from the obsession to drink, got the greatest miracle going on in our lives, but we can't find anything good to talk about. All we can do is bitch about something else. Y'all understand? <laughs> Y'all with me? And we sit there and tolerate it. We sit... There's a lady who wrote an article in Box 459 one time, and one day, and she's supposedly from New York, I'm going to find this lady and hug her. I don't know. That's what it is. She had 15 years of sobriety. I've talked about it on every tape I've ever done. She had about 15 years of sobriety when she wrote the article. And she said in this bit, she says, at what point does live and let live become apathy? At what point does live and let live become apathy? At what point am I going to sit there and listen to you piss and moan again and again and again in a meeting and turn my back in the guise of patience and tolerance. When am I going to turn to you and say, hey, buddy, <laughs> why don't you and me step outside after the meeting and finish this conversation? 
But right now, there's some people that have had spiritual experiences in this room that would like to share their hope with the newcomer. You mean to paraphrase it? Why don't you shut up? <laughs> and you see, I say this from the podium. I'm not, I'm not expecting you to go into your meeting. If somebody gets off the top, hey, shut up! You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and that's what a lot of y'all do. And you think... Guys, I lost his eye in a rock fight, not in an AA meeting. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, we cease fighting anything or anyone. It's a 10 step promise. Your job is not to go in an AA meeting and pick fights. I'm not suggesting that you do that. I'm saying as a group, we need to look at our group conscience and we need to look and see what we're doing in our meeting. At open discussion meetings, outnumbered literature based meetings, about six to one. You can go to Dallas, Texas. Right now, and there's, and there's an area, there's about 1,500 meetings a week in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Only 25 of those are literature-based meetings. Can y'all get down with this? That's why nobody can get sober. If you want to talk about the divorce one more time, we, we, you've got a bunch of choices, you see? But if you want to go read about the solution, you've got to hunt and pick, you see? And that's the problem. Because, and this is exactly what my sister back here was saying. It's the treatment centers that have gotten in the middle of this. You know what? You just, if you're having a bad day, you need to go share. You need to go talk about it. Why? <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but, but I mean, really, can we get serious? But what? Why do you need to go share it? Selfishness and self-centeredness that they covered so beautifully today is the root of my problem. What I need to do is get out of myself and, and try to help somebody else have a better day. And you want me to go to a meeting and just talk about my shit some more? Why don't you just hand me a lit cigarette and dump me with gas? Here, buddy, smoke this. This will help. <laughs> Isn't it the truth? All right, let me ask you a question. Did anybody hear me say that you shouldn't talk about your problem? I'm not, you need to talk about your problem. But why don't you talk to your, well, about the problem? It's exactly what Dave said this afternoon. Why don't you look around the fellowship? Okay, and find somebody who has had some similar problems, and then after the meeting, y'all go to dinner and talk about that. You see, there's two different things going on here. There's the fellowship over here, and there's the program over here. And you're in the fellowship. Jesus, we look at the look at the the knowledge and the experience that I could glean from this room about anything I ever wanted to know. I mean, truly. I mean, some of it, some pretty sick shit, I'm sure, but <laughs> but. but you know, we got, I'm sure you, you, you crack addicts slipped in these rooms too, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. I had you pegged right off the bat. I know, really. No, come on, guys. Of course we can do that. But, but in a meeting, we have one message. Our fifth tradition says we have one primary purpose, and that's to help the alcoholic get sober, folks. And, and if you're talking about the divorce, then you're missing the, the point. Because if she's drinking over the divorce, she ain't one of us. We're, we're, we're buying into it. We're feeding into it. Here's, here's the picture we're painting. Now, guys, this is why some of you are feeling uncomfortable, including myself, because I'm going to tell you, I've done it. I did it for years. Walk into a meeting, dump my problems, right? Expect y'all to fix it and then walk out and wonder why I couldn't stay sober. Y'all understand it? We're painting a picture for the world out there that if I can work with you and keep you in a place where you don't have any highs or any lows and that all your problems will be taken care of, that you can stay sober. <laughs> guys... Ladies, please, all of y'all play with me if you would, please. You don't have to if you don't want to, but raise your hand at this. Raise your hand if you drank when you had lots of money. Let the record show every hand in that place is up. <clears throat> How many when you didn't have any money? How many when you lived in a big, beautiful place like New York City? How many when you a little stupid place like Ingram, Texas? How many when you lived in a big old $300,000 home? A double wide. That's shit. Leave them up. Just leave the hands up. How many, here's the kicker. How many when you was in a relationship with somebody that, ab, an angel, a tremendous relationship with somebody? How many when you was dating Satan? <laughs> so why is it that we, this way, we talked about it earlier. It's, it's like, it's like Fred, the, Fred does in, in the stories, in the 23 to 43, Fred says, it, the line, best line in the book. It was the end of a perfect day, not a cloud on the horizon. What does some bitch do? He goes get drunk. <laughs> it's so perfect. I'll say, well, I'll just go screw it up. <laughs> and every one of us in here have done it. Why? Because we have lost the ability to choose whether we're going to do it or not. 
My circumstances are not a prerequisite for whether I'm going to drink or not. So why have we turned our meetings into a damn therapy session where that's all we talk about is our circumstances? Let's talk about the message. Let's talk about the power. Let's talk about God. You with us? I'll move on. I got a few minutes with you because I got to get this out. I'm fixing to choke. Let's, let's chat about these war stories, huh? Let's chat about the reason that we can't keep the young adults in our fellowship. Let's, let's chat about why so many women are leaving this fellowship. Who do you think you are with those war stories? I'll go back to Bill's story. <clears throat> uh, I've been thrown under the bus so many times with this. I, people come up after, after I talk and it's just the, you just, I just see it on their faces. They're coming up. I know, I know. You don't have to say it. Our stories are all we have because that's what we're taught. Our stories are all we have. Folks, let me tell you something. I didn't fly all this way up here 12 hours in an airport yesterday so I could come up here and share a stupid war story with you. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I ate out of dumpsters in Houston, Texas, and I've done some stuff on the street that I wouldn't talk about in mixed company. I've done some crazy, stupid, stupid things. Go with me? But I'm not up here to talk to you about that. I'm up here to talk to you about my life today in sobriety and how absolutely as cool it is to wake up and have that obsession gone. And if we have more people pulling people with the vision of that stuff instead of trying to scare some moron into these rooms, we, we would have success rates where we had them before. Let me tell you what the difference is. Where All of y'all want to take this and run with it. Because, of course, I have some stories. Let me tell you what Bill Wilson did. Eddie comes into his kitchen, and they talk, and they visit a little bit, and they share a few little stories, and get, gets Bill's confidence. Gets his, they identify a bit with their drinking. You with me? And then Ebby does this. Y'all can't see this on tape, but y'all see it. Yeah, some of y'all fishermen will know what I'm doing, right? And Ebby... He sets the hook, you know, and he tells him about God and, and what he's doing, right? And then Bill does the work. Bill Wilson, he goes and sees. After a bunch of false starts, Bill gets sober, and he, and he goes to Dr. Bob's house, right? And he sits down with Dr. Bob, and they share a few drinking stories. They sit down and start talking a little bit, and, under, and Bob understands that, that Bill really understands what he's talking about. And then he uh, sets the hook. He tells him about God and the steps. You with us? And, 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 and Dr. Bob gets the deal. And they go to alcoholic number three. It's the stories in the back, back in the vision for you. And it talks about them going to the third alcoholic. And, and it, they do the same thing. They tell a few stories. Do they tell all their stories? Do they tell a big long repertoire of, of drunkologues to bore the poor son of a bitch to death? They don't do any of that. I, I'm going to go into an AA meeting. And Randy's going to be in there. And she's not in a good place, and she's irritable, restless, and discontent. She's suffering from depression that only an alcoholic truly understands. Y'all understand that? And the fear that we've talked about all day long is eating her ass. And she's contemplating at the moment, if this doesn't work, you know, my only solution is to go off myself. You know, because this is cease being fun. The party's over. I want to die. Now then. I have some nasty stories I could tell her about the dumpster, uh, but she looks like a businesswoman to me. I could share some of my business stories with her and how I showed up at work loaded. You with me? She could identify with that. I could talk to some of my... You see, folks, I was not always eating out of dumpsters. Sometimes I was living in a penthouse in Houston, Texas. You see, and I have to look and see, where is my story best going to help her? That's called 12 Step. Speaking from the podium, telling your story is called telling your story. Let's don't get this shit confused, folks, because all of us are doing it. We're walking into a meeting, and the first thing I'm doing, hell, honey, you don't want to end up like me, do you? <laughs> and, she, and she backs up a little bit. Let me, let, me tell you about, let me tell you about eating out of dumpsters. She backs up a little bit more. And, and before about too many minutes has gone on, I have separated myself from her completely because I have a, a message of hope for her, but I, I'm not going to get a chance to tell her because we've already separated each other with the stupid war stories. I need to tell you a little bit about what's inside, folks. I need to talk about the spiritual malady that Mark and, and Dave have been talking about all weekend. I need to talk to you about this feeling of emptiness and the boredom and the depression and the anxiety and the gut-wrenching fear that we live with on a daily basis. And I'm going to tell you something. She'll relate. And I don't have to give her any stupid war stories. She'll relate to that. And then I can set the hook and tell her exactly what she needs to do to come out the other side smelling like a rose. It's called work the 12 steps. 
not any way you want it, exactly the way the book outlined. Is she going to do it exactly the way I did it? No. She'll put her own twist on it. Guys, I'm down with that, but she will work the steps. And as a result of working the steps, she will get the, the absolute, guaranteed spiritual experience. We've got too many people standing around this, this fellowship who have never had a spiritual experience talking like gurus from the podium. We've got way too many people in meetings sharing their damned opinions with a newcomer. We don't have enough people standing for what this needs to be about, which is truth. We need some people that are going to stand and listen to somebody. Say, you, listen, folks, if you tell an alcoholic, and I'm going to this one time, I mean, I realize this is an AA, but if you, if, I know we've got some crack addicts in here. We've got some cocaine addicts in here. I'm going to tell you straight. If you ask a cocaine addict or somebody who is truly an alcoholic to wait a year before they get active in this fellowship, they're dead. And what's the truth with my bullshit when I'm standing in front of a newcomer telling them to take their time to work the steps? We'll get on that next week. What am I? What, what's the truth? The truth is I don't want them to take their time so they can do it thoroughly. I, the truth is this. I don't have time to mess with them because I'm too busy with my own stuff. Isn't that the truth? I dust them off. In 1987, after that suicide attempt, folks, I'm going to tell you something. I was so done with living, it wasn't even funny. Antidepressants I'd taken all my life had stopped working. And I was... Guys, the paranoia was gut-wrenching, and I was starving to death because I was too afraid to even go in the store and buy food. And I had no money, and it was just... And it was right before Christmas, and here it was again. I had no money for gifts, and I had no, I had a plenty of love around me, a lot of family that loved me, but my life was in the toilet. And I'd wake up in the morning and say, I'm not going to drink, and I'm not going to do any drugs, and by that night, I'd be doing it again! I didn't know exactly how to get around this, you know, but I've always had somebody to blame. And at the last resort after that suicide attempt, I landed back in a room full of alcoholics and, not, and full of alcoholics who were all carrying big books. Guys, I cannot tell you how many times I travel. I travel hundreds of times a year. Folks, I'm going to tell you, little groups, big groups, wherever it is, and you walk in the room and you look around, oh, excuse me, wait, you got a big book on you? A big book? Oh, no, they sell those back up at the central service office. <laughs> It's like walking into an emergency room. You know, it's like, anybody got any medicine in here? You know? Like, oh, yeah, but it's all locked up in the fucking storeroom back over here. <laughs> Guys, we have one message. It's the big book. It's the 164 pages. It's the 12 steps. That's the message. And you know, guys, if you haven't worked the steps... You know, I hear Mark, my sponsor, he talks about all that. How do you know what you don't know? You know, if you've never worked the steps and you've never had a spiritual experience and you've never felt that, that pain and that weight that you've been carrying for years miraculously lifted off of you because you got off your ass and finally made that amends, you know, finally got connected in that fourth and fifth step and doing the stuff. If, you, if you've never sat in a room, walked in unexpectedly and caught one of your sponsees, one of the guys that you've been sponsoring, sitting over in the corner and he's got a big book open and he's he's... Eating some guy's ass, you know, telling him about God and the steps, and he's a, he's up to his butt in it, and right, and then you and he becomes so clear how this all goes around, and how the message was carried to me, and how I carried it to him, and now he's carrying it to somebody. But you see, if you've never experienced that, then how would you understand my passion? Don't expect you to. Our fellowships in the toilet. It is. And why? And why? Because we've walked on eggshells. We're so afraid of hurting somebody's sensitive little feet. I've said this on every tape I've ever done, folks. A nice lady like Randy comes in here and she needs help. But, oh, you're having a bad day. So go ahead and share with the group. And we'll listen to you for an hour. Piss and moan about your chicken shit day. And, and then she'll sit right here. Quietly get up and leave. Pick her coffee cup up. Go drop it in the trash. Walk out the back door. And die. Who the, who are we here for? Are we here for the alcoholic that's going to die? Or are we here some, with somebody who's too, who's too friggin' cheap to go get a good therapist? Start the car, Jeannie. <clears throat> you can always tell when the temperature of the room changes. 
I'm already in this far, and I love every one of you guys. I'm going to read something here and get out of here. I just I need to tell you real quick before I do. Uh, I honor and respect every one of you, I'm, but I'm going to say this point blank to you and anybody else, right straight to your face. It is not your right. It is not your right to ever come into a meeting and use it as a therapy session. Guys, we, we have a world full of great therapists. And I'm going to tell you, most of these cats work on a sliding scale. To think that AA is there for every little problem that you have. If you're working through some deep issue or a relationship problem or, uh, you know, I mean, I don't... The, <laughs> go find the help that you need. Call me and I will help you get that help. But, but couldn't we please understand that the early days of Alcoholics Anonymous were about prayer and worship. We're about somebody came up after a meeting after one of the first talks I ever did and he said, Priest, what do you think AA should be? A, a damn pep rally? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. We should be a room full of spiritual mentors. Everybody should be in here with one eye glued on me and the other on the, new, on the door for the newcomer walking in the door. My very life depends on working with that newcomer. It is not here so you could work through your chicken shit little problem. I'm going to tell you guys, if I, if I knew the answer, we'd help you. But I'm going to tell you, I don't know the answer what you need to do in your relationship. I don't even know what to do with mine. <laughs> what am I going to do talking to you? But it's the truth. I don't know what you need to do with your job. You need to move to Texas? Perhaps, perhaps not. I don't know. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. God does know. The whole purpose of working the steps is so that we can get connected to God. And that's what we have to do with a newcomer. We don't have a year to wait for you to get connected. We need your help now. I mean, we, we don't have enough people carrying the message. We've got a lot of people in the fellowship talking shit and spouting one-liners, but we don't have enough people to carry the message of hope to the newcomer. What's, what's happening in our service structure today? You know, i got to tell you straight, Box 459 a couple of years ago, last year they did this big deal. It was a great article. I can't believe that, that they actually printed it. Intergroup, intergroup. They, they did interviews with different intergroups around the country, around, around the, uh, the world. And they did one from Japan and they did one from New York. And a cat from New York said, he said, you know, the most frustrating thing about working intergroup is to find somebody to go do a 12-step call. He said, sometimes we got to call. This is a quote. I was going to bring it to read it, but I, I couldn't find it. He said, he said, He said, sometimes we have to call as many as 20 people in a row just to get one person to go do a 12-step call. And you wonder why the fellowship's in the toilet. You wonder why we give out desire chips like it was, they were, they were like candy. And why everybody wants to talk about relapse being so, so acceptable in this fellowship. Listen folks, relapse is not acceptable. A lot of people go die around a relapse. It's not acceptable. The book says that if you'll go work with others, you won't relapse. Only, only prerequisite to go work with others is to have work the steps and have a message to carry. We haven't got time for you to sit on your ass and get comfortable while, while, while we wait patiently for you to come help us in the trenches. We did a service workshop up in uh, Ingram where, where I go to meetings and we have a little clubhouse called the Outpost. How country is that crap? But it, uh, <laughs> it, was a bar, it was a barbecue beer joint before that, and so we just left the same name. And so, but it was a place called the Outpost, and we had this deal. We, we invited the 31 groups in our district for this service deal. You know how many people showed up? How many groups were represented? Five. Mark Houston and I, two years ago, did a deal down in Pasadena, and they had 120 groups represented in that district. Do you know how many showed up? Eight. Now, you know, listen, guys, everybody looks around and gets uncomfortable with this, but whose responsibility is this? Let me tell you what it is, folks, and this will be the icing on the cake for some of you. You'll just, I'm off your Christmas card list forever after this. <laughs> Let me tell you what it is. It's just exactly what I've heard my sponsor say a thousand times. It's called piss poor sponsorship. Every problem that we have out there is, is I look the other way. You, you think it's okay for you to come into a meeting and not share and not, not participate and not do anything, but you're, but you're, at least I'm sober today. Big deal. Big deal. That's not the, that's, come on. We need your help. You think it's okay for you not to participate in, in, in group service stuff? It's not okay. We need everybody on the firing line if we're going to turn this around. I'm going to tell you something, folks. Everybody wants to spend, including me, spend a lot of time in, in, in AA and NA, all the fellowships, bad mouth and treatment centers. You know, it's my prayer that we, we put all the treatment centers out of business. Because I'm going to tell you this right off the bat, folks. If AA was doing what they were supposed to do, most of the treatment centers would be out of business anyway. 
All we would have is a bunch of detox facilities. But you see, they can't get it in AA anymore because we're too busy talking about your chicken shit problems. We got the message, but nobody wants to talk about it. And if, it, if that offends you, I don't know what else. I don't know what to say. Look at the statistics yourself and see what it's about. I'll say this again. I know, I know. All right. <clears throat> Guys, on a, on a chapter called We Agnostics, uh, this is a, a, a chapter I skipped for a long time because I wasn't an agnostic. I believed in God. <laughs> <laughs> right up in the time I got Mark as a sponsor, he, he, he made it pretty clear that I was the biggest agnostic in the group. I'm in there whining about money and whining about my relationships, whining about the car, whining about everything. Said so you, is God everything or nothing, Chris? Well, God's everything, but but, but God damn, He could throw a little more money my way, you know. And it's like, <laughs> isn't that the truth? I'm all, I'm too busy looking over here to see what you got on your plate, you know. And when I finally got that from here to here, my life's never been the same. I'm charmed, folks. Thank God this program is not about justice. It's about mercy. Thank God for that. Page 45, it says, this Lack of power, that's our dilemma. We had to find a power greater than ourselves, obviously, but where and how are we going to find this power? This is the crux of the problem here, folks. I need some power. Well, that's exactly what this book's about. Its main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself that's going to solve your problems. You with me? Okay. And I go into meetings, and all I hear is people talking about powerlessness. If the main purpose of this program is to give the newcomer power, to give the alcoholic some power to overcome alcoholism and drug addiction and the spiritual malady and the selfish and self-centeredness that's eaten us alive, to get past the depression and the fear, and to go out there and have a cool life, why is it that we just want to continue to talk about powerlessness? You know, and I think it's doing a lot of people a great big, big chunk of disservice by doing that. You know, I think it's one thing for a bunch of us smug sons of bitches who've got a little money in our pocket to sit in a meeting and say, yeah, we're powerless, all right, we're powerless. And then you get somebody that's coming off the street, somebody of color who's been discriminated all their life, some woman who's just been gang raped in a goddamn crack house, and then we're going to come in here with this flippant bullshit about being powerless. I'm just powerless. I'm powerless over people, places, and things. (laughs) That is so much crap. That is so much crap. Guys, powerless is only used once in the big book. We only talk about it when we're doing the steps. And then it says we were powerless. I am not powerless, folks. I am not powerless. I am not powerless. I am not powerless. Y'all understand that? (laughs) I'm with a woman I want to be with tonight. I got money in my pocket tonight. I'm surrounded by friends that I know and love. A lot of y'all I've known for years. I haven't eaten out of a dumpster in 13 years. i got some great power in my life. And when we want to stop watering this message down and getting so smarmy with a newcomer, in the back of the book, I usually try to stay out of there, but there's some great stuff back there. But the basic text is in the front. <laughs> Well, one more time, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's, you're going to see it in the fourth edition coming out. You know, they've changed a bunch of the stories. You should have seen the first original stories that they took out of the, and when they did the second, the second edition, you know, there's some of the, the best stories about God they took out, you know. I mean, who arbitrarily decided this crap, you know? I mean, again, back in success, success rates of nearly 100% 66 years ago, and we just keep jockeying with it, turning it around, you know, so somebody can identify. I mean, who has to, what is this deal about identification? We just got to get somebody to get people off their butt and do the work. I mean, I don't understand. Jesus, unbelievable. Here. Here. Let me give you this so I can get out of here. Here's, here's what it says. This is in a great story. It's called Me, an Alcoholic. It's a great, it's, uh, this is pretty good. He goes, this guy goes to this doctor, right? And he, the guy can't get sober. And then finally he gets down to the doctor, a lot like uh, uh, Ebby did with, with Carl Young. He says, he gets down to brass tacks. And the doctor finally says, it says, uh, then God, he said, then God, why in God's name haven't you told me during all these years? He just told him that he was an alcoholic. He said, two reasons. He's talking to the drunk. He said, first, I couldn't be sure. The line between a heavy drinker and an alcoholic is not always clear. Amen. 
It wasn't until that, just lately that in your case I could draw it. Second, you wouldn't have believed me anyhow. Okay? I had to admit to myself that he was right. Only through being beaten down by my own misery could I have ever accepted the term alcoholic as applied to myself. Now, however, I fully accepted it. I knew from my general reading that alcoholism was irreversible and fatal. And I also knew that somewhere along the line I'd lost the power to stop. Okay? He said, well, Doc, what are we going to do about it? How many of us have done that? Well, what are we going to do? Doctor, here, there's nothing I can do. This is a doctor. This is a, an honest doctor saying that he can't treat alcoholism. Another pill ain't going to fix it, folks. I've heard of an organization called Alcoholics Anonymous and some success with people like you. They make no guarantees and are not always successful. But if you want, you're free to give them a shot. It might work. Many times in the intervening years, I have thanked God for that man, a man who had the courage to admit failure, a man who had the humility to confess that all of his hard-won learning of his profession could not turn up the answer. I looked up an AA meeting and went there alone. Now, this is what I did. Let me tell you how this went. I tried to commit suicide on November 13, 87. Aborted that attempt. It was the 12th. On the 13th, I went to a doctor that morning and had this same conversation with the doctor. I'd never read this. Had the same conversation with the doctor. Doctor says, Chris, you need to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. He gave me some Librium to get me through the detox, to help me with detox. I had no money. I couldn't go to, to any kind of inpatient facility. And uh, I sat in my first meeting that night, November 13th, cold November night up in North Texas, and detoxed in that meeting. With those people around me with paper, plenty of paper towels to clean up the mess I was making. You with me? And so much love, you couldn't believe it. And we didn't talk about war stories. And we didn't piss and moan about problems. We talked about God. And we talked about hope. Here I found an ingredient. It's just what I found that night. Here I found an ingredient that had been lacking in all other efforts to save myself. Here was power. Italicies, exclamation point. Power, folks, in the meeting. In a room full of people. Here was power to live to the end of the day. Power to have the courage to face the next day. Power to have friends. Power to help people. Power to, to be sane. Isn't that great? How many of you guys have ever been certifiably crazy? Power to be sane. Yeah. Power to stay sober. Well, that was seven years ago and many AA meetings ago. And I haven't had a drink during those seven years. Moreover, I'm deeply convinced so long as I continue to do this in my bumbling way towards the principles I first encountered, I'm going to stay sober. Here's it is. What's that power? He says, with my AA friends, all I can say is a power greater than myself. Be still and know that I'm God. You with me? Next paragraph. This is what I want you to see, folks. Please, in case any of you think that I was making fun of your issues earlier, I want you to hear what I'm saying. My story has a happy ending, but not of the conventional kind. I had a lot more hell to go through. But what a difference there is going through hell without a power greater than myself and with it. As might have been predicted, my teetering tower of worldly success collapsed. My alcoholic associates fired me, took control and ran the enterprise into bankruptcy. My alcoholic wife took up with someone else, divorced me, and took our remaining property. The most terrible blow of my life befell me after I found sobriety through AA. Perhaps the single flicker of decency that had shone through the fog of my drinking was a clumsy affection for my two children, a boy and a girl. One night my son was 16 and was suddenly uh, and tragically killed. The higher power was on deck to see me through. And I think he's okay there with my son too. And that's what he's talking about. And I haven't lost a son, but I sit in these meetings and I listen to what y'all have been through. And I know life's not perfect. And everything just didn't come up rosy because you got sober. Life's a bitch. Life's tough. On a given day, it can turn, it can just, it can just go to hell in a handbasket, folks. And that's why I'm so passionate. And that's why this thing is so important a message to not dilute. Anybody can stay sober when life is good. But what are you going to do when the ill winds turn towards you? What are you going to do when she leaves or when the job goes or the health goes? What are you going to do when things don't go exactly your way? Lack of power is the dilemma. I can't keep it together myself. I need to turn to all things to the Father of light. Isn't that what the book says? And you can't do it alone. And the fellowship is not going to do it for you. You can sit in these meetings until the cows come home and nothing's going to change. That's why we have this, these rooms so... so so unevenly divided with people who have had a spiritual experience and who are people who are just staying sober one stupid day at a time. The, we've got to get to this place where we understand that God's grace is there for everybody. 
but, it's, but, but the book says a price has got to be paid. We talked about doing a fourth step this afternoon, a fifth step, and just sitting down and making amends in, in this prayer and meditation life. Guys, all of this takes effort. Don't you all understand that? And most of the people won't take that effort. But when they don't and they relapse, just like we see thousands of people from my hospital do, let's don't look the other way and just pretend that nothing happened. It's just, I heard some son of a bitch in a meeting in San Antonio last week say, well, it just wasn't their time. How, who, who, what arrogance. Who are we to say when it's your time to get sober? Let me tell you something, folks. In 1980, I needed to get sober. I wanted to get sober. I had to get sober. And I didn't get sober for seven more years because nobody ever slowed down and said, buddy, 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 easy, easy. Let's start these work. Let's do this work. Let's work these steps in a few days, in a few weeks. Let's, let's, let's allow you to have a spiritual experience so that the obsession to use will leave you and you can get well. They, they, they finally cared enough about me and my relationship with God and they did my sensitive little feelings. Somebody finally stopped walking on eggshells around Chris Kramer. And they said, buddy, do you want this or not? It wasn't placed to me as a suggestion. We're not a social organization offering you membership in the fellowship of love. <laughs> I got a puke. Folks, let me paint a clearer picture for you. This is what they call the last house on the block. This is the only solution for alcoholism and drug addiction that we know. And shame on us if we who have the answer is not out there kicking butt and taking names. Two weeks after I walked into that fellowship, folks, I got out of my truck after a Friday night meeting. Two weeks to the day, I got out of my truck after a 6 o'clock meeting just like this outside. It's just overcast just like this. And I got out of my truck. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. Everything had shifted in my life. All the anger and hate that I brought into that meeting two weeks ago had gone. All the fear, the depression, you with me? <laughs> Guys, I'm in, my, I'm in a fourth step. I'm in the fourth column of my fourth step where I get to start seeing that I set the ball motion. That, 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 that I, I wasn't a victim. I, I volunteered for every mission. Oh, pick me! Pick me! I, I, I'd volunteer. <laughs> I had volunteered for all that stuff. Because of my selfishness and self-centeredness, I had found the sickest women in the world to go out with, the, the most dead-end jobs. I would put myself in all of these situations to be hurt, right? Steady blaming everybody because I can't catch a break. And I finally, that night, sat on the back of my truck and cried real dog tears. I'm telling you, I was, I couldn't believe what had happened. And you know, as I'm sitting there trying to gain my composure, I realized that the obsession to use had been lifted from me. And I got liquor stores all around me. I got a drug dealer that lives in the same apartment complex. Folks, let me tell you something. I'm surrounded by quote unquote triggers. <laughs> Jesus. The obsession had been removed from me. I was not keeping myself away. Y'all understand? I was talking to a guy the other day. There's a capital of Texas is Austin. It's about 120 miles away. And he said, he said, Chris, I can't go back to Austin. There's too many triggers there. There's too much. I said, where are you going to move? He said, Houston. <laughs> what? what? It made sense to him. I understand that, but it's not right. I can't hide from alcohol and drugs, folks. The obsession has got to be removed or we don't get well. Go with me. This program is about power. And it's about responsibility. Give me one minute. One minute. Folks, the reason I'm so controversial and the reason I, I, I get under... Some of you will be emailing for the rest of our lives as close friends because we're all on the same page. I've talked to a lot of y'all all day long and bless every one of you. Every one of you that have a week's sobriety and that are out there actively trying to carry the message, thank you for staying. I'm going to say this. Any old-timers in here that have multiple of years that are staying in this fellowship, because I'm telling you, the old-timers are leaving by the thousands because they're sick and tired of listening to the shit that has become Alcoholics Anonymous. And I can't blame them for doing that. I wish they wouldn't, but it's their right. And I understand why they do it. Because if they don't get in a place where they can hear some solution, they're going to die too. And they don't want to drink either. You, you, it takes courage to change the tide, folks. And that's one of the things that, that comes with spirituality. Uh, Dave talked about it today. Uh, Mark talked about it. It's called discipline. And you've got to discipline yourself and stand for something. Why, why is it that we're so worried about what that person's going to say? Just because that person has 10 years of sobriety, 
I heard a guy with 30 years of sobriety say that alcoholism wasn't a disease and you could stop whenever you got ready to put the plug in the jug. <laughs> and wherever he is today, I hope he's healthy and happy. But Jesus, how many newcomers did he kill with that bullshit? But he had 30 years of sobriety, so who's, so who's going to listen? Everybody. See, if you can't reconcile it with what's in the book, you might want to forget it, folks. For every woman that's come into this fellowship and stayed, I'm going to tell you, I, I get weepy around the women. We don't have enough women in the fellowship to do the work, okay? One of the problems that Dave talked about today, you know, is the deal. a lot of us guys have ended up having to sponsor women, not because we wanted to, but because there was nobody left to do it. You see, AA women have a tendency to come in and get sober, then they get married, then they get home, and little hubby decides he didn't want them to hang out and go to those meetings anymore. So all of a sudden, we've got a new higher power in our life. It's the husband. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. I've said it every time I've talked. Some of you women need to get some courage behind your little back here and say, hey, listen, little buddy. Uh... <laughs> you don't like me giving back to this fellowship. You can get your little happy horse ass out of here. Okay? Because I serve one God. I serve one God. We all serve the same God. And I'm going to tell you something. We don't have enough help in the trenches to turn this tide. Everybody thinks the treatment centers are going to do it. Everybody thinks medicine's going to do it. We're going to do it. We're the only people that are going to do it. When your meeting goes down the toilet, stop it. Say, excuse me a minute. I'm not chairing this meeting, but it seems to me that we've gotten a little off the subject. If we perhaps go back on the subject, you will not be popular. but you might save somebody's life. If somebody's monologuing in a meeting and have talked, we have a little bell at our meeting in the Hill Country at the outpost. We have a little bell, very nice little bell, very nothing outrageous, you know, but you've got five minutes to share your stuff. And in our preamble, it says we're not here as a dumping ground for your problems. If you don't want to talk about anything else that's not in the literature that we're covering tonight, you might want to be quiet. And you can talk for five minutes and then we're going to get a little bell and ding it and everybody has a good laugh and then we go on to the next person. But nobody has to sit there and listen to some some idiot pontificate in a meeting. Because you see, I may hear what I need to hear tonight from you, but I may not get a chance if the person over here doesn't shut up. See, I got one hour a day. We got two or three meetings a week that maybe we can go to. Folks, we can't live in AA. Don't expect you to. Let's make those meetings as powerful as possible. If you're going out of that meeting and we're shaping you came in, folks, I hear that all the time in AA. I never was in a meeting I didn't get something out of. You're a goddamn liar. I know. I mean, I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm, I appreciate your, your, your spiritual connection, you know, but I bought, I bought that a meeting suicidal. I mean, I just like, what the shit did we just listen to? You, you with me? At some point, we got to stop it and say, no, excuse me a minute. We're going to talk about God in the steps. And after the meeting, let's go talk about that cool stuff that you need to talk about because the fellowship can help you with that problem too. But in the meeting, we're going to try to help somebody not drink today. Is that cool? I love everyone. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.